So hello everyone, welcome. I'm Mandy Chen. On behalf of the SMITA Board of Directors, I welcome you. I'm very excited to introduce Jane Mundo, who is offering this session entitled A Somatic Journey at the Intersection of Headaches, Migraine, Myofascia Pain and Awareness. Thank you, Mandy. I'm really delighted to be here and talk about what I do and also give you an experience of it. I want to thank Ismeta and Pacifica Graduate Institute and everyone who's here. It's amazing to be with people from around the world who are uh, practitioners and studying and interested in the somatic discourse. So, um, I wanted to bring this into three areas of like three parts of my talk. So um, of this session, the first is my journey to healing. And then the second is how I developed the approach that I've used for the past 50 years to, uh, to headache, working with headache and migraine. And then to actually do a somatic self-massage practice um, so that you can actually feel some benefit. And especially since we're all at home, we need that self-touch and self-care. So I wanna do something around that today. Um, well, I'd like to see as we start who of you is here because, and I'll see if I can see you all, but maybe not, but just so that you can participate in this way. How many of you, if you would raise your hands, are here because you have had or have now a condition of headache or migraine or myofascial pain? And how many of you are here because you work with clients who do? Um, so my journey with this began 50 years ago, um, but uh, first I wanted to talk actually about headache types. So when we talk about headaches, just so we can have a, a, a framework, there are four basic types of headaches that I work with or that you can consider that are primary. There are more than 300 types but in general broad categories and primary means that you, um, the, the headache or migraine is the first cause. And um, migraine are debilitating, they're an estimated 37 million people, um, two thirds of whom are women in the United States that get them, um, plus men and uh, uh, children as part of that 37 million people and 1 billion, billion people worldwide. Migraine is uh, characterized by debilitating, pulsating, pounding, tight um, uh, sensations on the head. And it's, but it's not just a whole head phenomenon, it's a whole body phenomenon. So you can become sensitive to sound and light and odors super sensitive to touch. So people talk about their hair hurting. Um, you can have nausea and vomiting, and it's very debilitating. People, when you talk about 37 million and 1 billion worldwide, that's something that you just get them, that's annually, but people have them for years and for decades. I've worked with many people who've had them starting at age six and 12 or as children. Um, because there are two-thirds women, there's definitely a hormonal component. Um, tension type headaches are the most common, and those feel like tightness and tension around the head, like a vice grip or a really tight hat band. Most people that I work with have a combination of both, so migraine and tension type headache. And then also the symptoms of tension type headache are also thought to be part of migraine in some cases, so people feel a a stuck, not like sensation, pain in the back of the head or in the jaw um, or in the neck or in the shoulder, like a knot. And that can be part of it. So mixed or basically the worst of both. 
And then there's also a type of headache called cluster headache, and those affect more men. They are typically and often seen in smokers, cigarette smokers, and they are called cluster headaches because they come in clusters. So you might get them eight a day and then for days on end and then not have them for weeks or, or six months. They're thought often to be seasonal. And those are characterized by stabbing in one eye and also tearing in one eye and same side nostril. And those often sadly are called suicide headaches. They're super painful. I've never had one. I've seen a lot fewer people with them and clients that, clients to me, patients to doctors that have been diagnosed with them often might have migraine when they've been diagnosed with cluster. So cluster headache is really different. And this is why I think the diagnosis sometimes is different than actually what they have. Um, because with cluster headache, you want to pace the floor, bang your head against the wall, to get active. There's uh, people get anxious and angry uh, while they're having it. Whereas with migraine, you really can hardly move. Like the slightest movement of your head can set off your symptoms to be exponentially worse. Like just incremental movements. So they're very different. I don't work with that many cluster headaches. They have been helped by. Um, oxygen, which um, I do work with breathing. So I think that breathing and just getting more breath in the system can help. When you're working with headaches and migraines, it's not just the pain and the symptoms that you're working with. It's that people, especially migraine sufferers, because they've been trying so many things, uh, including seeing multiple doctors, trying multiple um, complementary therapies, they over time get really feel frustrated, helpless, hopeless, and victimized by their pain. So that becomes actually part of the pain. And from my point of view, that worrying and what I call fear of the next pain produces tightening in the body that then makes it more likely that you, um, your combination of factors and triggers will add up to a migraine. So it becomes um, the thinking and worrying about it can actually make it more likely that you will get one. My journey began um, because my mom used to get migraines when I was a kid. And somehow I knew to, she would just say, can you just relieve my neck and shoulders? And I was able to um, iron out the knots and spurs in her upper back and neck, and that gave her some relief. Although it didn't quell the migraine, she would spend many days lying down, um, cold compress on her head, um, taking whatever medications um, were given it back in the day, which was, you know, like 40 and 50 years ago, um, and um, be really miserable. So I had that experience of her, but I didn't really get migraines myself. Um, but in 1970, in my early 20s, I heard of a claim that you could put your hands on the front and back of someone's head and stop their pain. I thought that was really interesting, being that she had suffered so much. And so I began experimenting with it. And I did have some headaches and migraines, but I didn't realize that they were migraine at the time. And as I experimented with it, I could feel the headache or migraine pulsating on the head and feeling it releasing, but I didn't really have a method to it. I didn't know exactly what I was doing, but I was able to both relieve my own and others' migraines on the spot. And after I figured out how to do that, I became a magnet for people who had them because wherever I was, whether there's a party, shopping somewhere, <laughs> wherever wherever I was, somebody would exclaim in my presence, oh, I've got such a migraine, oh, I've got such a headache, I'm gonna go leave the party, I have to lie down, whatever it was that they were gonna do. And so they didn't know that I could do what I was doing to relieve pain. And they, I would say, well, 
uh, I can help you. And at that time, I would take them into a corner of the room or into, uh, there was, I remember there was a, an employee at a, a clothing shop back in the dressing room and um, just work on their migraine and they were able to get relief. Um, and what was interesting about it to me was, um, so it was the transcranial touch therapy. So I'm working through the head, not on the head and the neck. And what was super interesting to me also was that it reversed not only the pain of the migraine, but the other symptoms that I was talking to you about. So if they had um, um, nausea or were experiencing light sensitivity or uh, sensitivity to odors um, all of the, or light, all those things would reverse. So the cycle started to unwind just with that shift on the head, which told me that it's doing something to the brain. But I didn't really know anything about that stuff at the time. Um, and then I um, started having my own symptoms when I was going through perimenopause. And that's when I really started tackling it as a whole body and whole person phenomenon, not just a relief method, which a relief method is great into itself. But um, if you can prevent, then why not do that? Um, so the other thing is that I did have a background in spiritual practice and meditation and living in intentional community for about 15 years, um, starting in 1970 as well. So I didn't, because we lived a holistic natural lifestyle, um, for any of you 60s people, you might've heard of it called the farm in Tennessee. And um, we also had home births. So I learned a lot about the mind-body connection and working through birth as a mind-body phenomenon. We also grew all our own food. So we lived a holistic lifestyle. We, we grew it, we um, made everything from scratch. We preserved it. And so when I was going through my own migraine during perimenopause, um, I turned to those holistic methods because I've always tried to go lowest on the food chain as far as um, relieving pain. Um, also at that time, um, I started reading medical and consumer literature because I didn't really know how big of a problem it was. And back at that time, there were 25 million people in the US who were getting migraines and they mostly used um, medical, the medical treatment was um, medication, prescription medication or over the counter medications. Um, in 1991, when I was going through my, my own symptoms, I thought, well, um, I, and doing all the reading and with my background, I noticed that um, some months I would not get a blazing migraine the day before my period. And when I started looking at that and taking that apart, I noticed that on the days that I was feeling, uh, on the months before that I was taking better care of myself, I mean, just simple things, but they made such a big difference. So when I was um, eating better, sleeping better, under less stress, exercising more, lo and behold, I wouldn't get a blazing migraine the day before my period. And so that with my reading, and everything, I started to put it together into a program and um, decided to teach people, got a, uh, became a certified massage therapist, got a license to touch, so to speak, and also studied energy work on the body, intuitive development, and got my first patients from a neurologist at UCLA. And she said, um, well, you were uh, successful in being able to help people stop their own migraines, and, but they came back, which I knew because I wasn't doing a preventive program. So at that point, that's when I got serious and started creating my program for both relief and prevention for self-care. Um, the other thing that happened with me is that um, after massage school, uh, well, at the end of it, I got really bad carpal tunnel syndrome. And my dad, who was an orthopedic, therapy, uh, orthopedic surgeon, um, gave me a brace. I wore a brace for the, I don't know, six, nine months. I slept in it. <laughs> I did everything. Nothing changed. And um, had a friend who referred me to a breathwork workshop. And I'm like, breathing? What's that? You know, what, what's that got to do with anything in my arms? And so doing this breathwork workshop, 
Um, actually, what happened was that I had a huge emotional release. And with that emotion, all these memories and um, uh, also released and my back released that had been locked up for uh, 15 years. And I started also training in Qigong, which also released my arm. So when that back release happened um, and the instructor also had said, um, Notice how your spine moves when you breathe. Like I'm like, your spine's supposed to move when you breathe because my spine hadn't moved for a long time and I had no idea of that concept. I started training in breathing and um, also, uh, and in somatics. And also what happened around that time is that my um, clients, when I would see my first headache clients as referred by the um, UCLA neurologist, Dr. Susan Perlman, um, when I had them on the table and would um, help them release their pain, their emotional content would come up. And I didn't really understand why that was happening or what to do. So that coupled with my own emotional release of my back led me to um, really deepen in the field of somatics and study and train in it. So I found the Hendricks, who was the uh, Gay and Kathleen Hendricks, who were the teachers of the breathwork teacher, Mitchell May, that I had had that experience with. And um, they really worked with bodily cues, um, verbal cues to shift the body and shift one's presence and really create a new reality. So it was really sourcing the body and your sensations. And then I also found Richard Strozzi Heckler and trained um, in his work for many, many years. And that work um, is really interesting because not only are you working with your sensations and also the work of Stacey Haynes in trauma and how trauma shows up and your practices show up in your body, but um, how you can use your practices and use your awareness to decouple from your trauma and your old patterns and get to the underlying causes of why you might be reacting in a certain way or holding your body in a certain way and working with your posture and your center and and feeling the way um, your body and gravity um, so there were different ways of centering and aligning and breathing that really helped me craft my program and also a little book that i found on a diet that worked with um, um, the theory uh, by rodolfo Lowe that worked with the theory of that um, oftentimes people with migraines, and he was a sufferer as well, had um, borderline low blood sugar. And so you didn't necessarily have to have the test because the type of test didn't work um, in the way that headache and migraine, well, migraine people um, respond. Uh, but you can just eat six small meals or three meals and three snacks a day. So things like that, like that seeing common sense wisdom that we've lost track of, um, helping people with that and ground into that with a, a certain rigor and um, where they can begin to track it and, and connect the dots, that's what I created. So it's a um, comprehensive, holistic, hands-on somatic self-care program that I ended up calling the Mundo program and my method, the Mundo method, that looks at all areas of someone's life. So you triggers, um, that could be foods, diet, what and when you eat and drink, medications, hormones, environment, lifestyle, and stress. And I often work with neurologists um, to help their patients and clients. Um, so it seems obvious, I guess, but the narrative when I started working with people was that, um, you know, your headaches and migraines don't have anything to do with you and your basically your it's not your fault which put them in the position of being a victim of their pain and so um, what I really saw as an inroad to shift people's pain dramatically and over time and in the moment and make sustained change is to help them come into their bodies and become close observers of every little parts of their lives. So the devil's in the details and so to speak, become their own headache detectives. 
so that they can um, then shift their practices, take action on it and come into balance. And lo and behold, when your practices shift, then you get a different result. So it's kind of really simple cause and effect. However, when you start working with people and their patterns and their habits, then they can get triggered. So their stuff comes up. <laughs> um, anyway, I brought this program into, um, so I'll talk about that more. Um, I brought this program into medical centers and universities, staff and faculty wellness programs, corporations and, and conferences. And in 2001, some nurse practitioner candidates found my work um, and they asked to do a study of it. And their study was published in an in international peer reviewed medical journal named Cephalalgia. Uh, it's an international journal of headache and pain. And the study showed that uh, 78 migraine patients um, who took a brief four, five, or six week program through their HMO, which was, it really depended on how long the, the HMO or the, the, the medical institution would allow the program to be. Um, and these patients had a median of 19 headache years, which means some had less, some had more. And this was a really short program compared to how I work now. It's two hours a week with practices and homework in between um, that they were able to reduce their migraine by 41%, the number that, of migraines that they got um, per week and per month. And they were able to reduce their use of abortive medications by 52%, which was, I thought, really amazing. <laughs> and, um, and what I thought was also really interesting was that 97% reported that they felt better about, more educated and more in control of their migraine. So 97% were not the, the, they were still having migraines because only 41% reduced their number of migraines. So people were still having them, but they still felt better and they felt better about them because they were more educated and more in control. Um, in, in 2018, um, I, wrote and published uh, my book, uh, published by New World Library, and it's called The Headache Healer's Handbook. And it teaches the program it's based on 50 years of work, basically a dream come true to have that all out there and all the nuances of what I used to teach people about, not just the handouts, like everything that I would talk to them about in between the handouts and some research and um, um, a basis in different practitioners and different work, including biofeedback, including um, Hannah Somatics, including um, so many things um, that preceded my work. Um, the, the book is available in 25 countries and it, was, it has four foreign editions. Um, it was translated into complex Chinese, Italian, and soon to be um, coming my way. It's out, but I just don't have it yet. It's in Russian. So, um, um, that's just been my journey. And that journey really, as you can tell by the way I described it, begins with one's awareness and one's thoughts. And so when you're working with people who have chronic pain, chronic myofascial pain, chronic migraine, chronic headaches, it's a process of not only working with their pain, but really reshaping their assumptions and teaching them about the mind-body connection and looking deeply into their lives and connecting the dots. And so that's why I think that a somatic approach works so beautifully because it works with the underlying causes that hold those thoughts in, and patterns in place. And um, those patterns can show up in people's language, in their mood, in their posture, um, the way they see the world, how they work with their pain, how they experience their pain and how they're able to take care of themselves. So foundational to the somatic approach, meaning the living body and mind, body, emotions, and spirit, the whole self, the, our history lives in the body. The history lives in the body and that by being present to where we feel stuck and tight, where we feel our pain, where we feel held, where we can't feel our body, where we feel numb, and then um, um, bring our awareness to it, 
that we can release our pain and our emotions and memories and the choices that created those states, which is what I described when I was describing what happened um, when my back released during transformational breath work. Um, so in doing the self-care program, the narrative and people speaking their story um, is really important. And so it follows a certain set of um, really self-investigation where you look at all different areas of your life and what might be causing your pain. And so those areas of your life might be, uh, you know, your environment, how you sit and stand, what you eat and drink, um, again, your mood, how you breathe. So we consider everything, how you sit in your car, how you sit in your chair, um, how you respond to a stressful phone call. So really we're looking at everything. And then instead of prescriptions, we're giving practices. And this is what helps people. And the process begins with an intake questionnaire that is designed to start that process and initiate um, the client's thinking into orienting and connecting their lives with their pain. Because actually what I found is that a lot of times people really, um, uh, as Dr. Criswell was saying, as Eleanor Criswell was saying, um, Mr. Duffy lived a short distance from his body. So people have pain, they're aware of their pain, but they don't necessarily connect it to their lives or anything that they're doing. They, it just seems to miraculously appear. And so empowering them step-by-step step to get into the process and then take charge of it is it's a whole other world for them. Um, the somatic awareness uh, guides people's attention when working with their pain. So for the practices that I will give, the somatic awareness and being aware of how you are in your body and your sensations is key. And also checking in with yourself before and after a practice, like what changed, what's different, what do you notice? So it's all seeing what happens and, and encouraging people to appreciate the small steps and the small shifts that they're taking. Sometimes they'll be like, oh yeah, I felt that change, but what about this and what about that? I feel like, let's just sit with what you're feeling, right? They're on to the next and worry, like the fear of the next pain is really strong in people, in all of us. So um, breathing, um, I always talk about breathing lower, not deeper, helping people shift their gravity, because if you take a deep breath, so if everybody would just take a deep breath right now and see what happens. So it might happen, not happen with you because you're somatically trained, many of you and practitioners, but a lot of people, uh, my clients, when they come in the door and, or when they come on the Zoom <laughs> or the FaceTime or the Skype, now um, their deep breath will look like this. And so you can see that when I do this, it's not only that I'm breathing high and getting less oxygen, all true, but also all these muscles that can um, be part of the migraine syndrome. So chest, shoulders, upper back, neck, scalp, face can tense up. So breathing lower and shifting the center of gravity is um, really helpful for people. Um, so we do a daily practice with that. Um, meditation calms the mind and calms the body, but also that focus of bringing your awareness back into your breath, back into your body, back into your center. In meditation, in this case, we do mindfulness meditation, vipassana. It prepares people to do the touch work because the touch work gets more and more and more specific. Um, also, we work with vertical line and posture so that you can use gravity when seated in doing various activities and, and come back to center and keep settling and working with the vertical line because head forward posture is really common, especially now that we're on our devices so much and head down. So all these, uh, this fascia, these muscles then tend to tighten chronically. <laughs> And then they can get set that way so that people are walking around this way. So it's a process of bringing back your awareness into your body, into your seat, 
and um, dropping your center of gravity and being uh, vertically aligned. Because if you work on yourself, you try and relieve, say, your shoulders or your neck or your head, and you're out of alignment, then you're working against yourself because your muscles and ten fascia are tense and contracted while you're trying to loosen them. So working with an aligned body and um, a postural vertical line does half the work right there for you. And so all these other practices do half the work. And then attention to mood, uh, where people just are carrying this mood and just by recognizing and acknowledging what's your mood right now and what are those sensations are another way to bring people into their bodies. And so to be able to basically, as you do these practices um, on a daily basis, then um, as they do them, as we all do them, they begin to become embodied. So it's a matter of evening out the scales. So we've had this much time, or I've had this much time practicing an intense out of alignment body. And then so one time, <laughs> I'm not, I, I'm practicing alignment and my body is relaxing. So just giving people, they can't always recognize it at first. Sometimes they can just feel a little bit of it, but then over time they'll be able to feel it. So I always say changes happen in the moment and over time. And then um, what I was talking about, about triggers coming from all um, um, areas of our lives. Uh, sometimes people will try one kind of, um, uh, therapy, they'll try, say, medication, but especially with complementary and alternative medicine and trying one kind of therapy, or just say an elimination diet, and they'll eliminate one thing out of one area of their lives, or they'll eliminate certain foods, or they'll add certain foods, and then that'll work for a little while, and then it will stop working, and that's because they're not looking at themselves as a whole being, so we're not just our foods, not just our thoughts, we're not just the tension in our bodies, we're all of that. So that's what I call the Chinese menu theory. So when I was a kid, we used to go to Chinese food restaurants and eat family style on Sunday nights. And we would each order a dish from column A, column B, column C, column D and order family style. Then they would, um, all the dishes would be brought out and they'd put it on a large lazy Susan in the middle of the table. And then not only were we choosing from our own column A, column B, column C as part of that menu, we were choosing, we could have a little bit from, you know, the rest of our family's dishes that they chose, right? So if instead of ordering up someone's um, family style dinner, you were to order up um, your own or a client's migraine, and especially foods are important with migraine, but you could look at other triggers both with migraine and tension type headache, you could choose, uh, instead of choosing dishes of food, you could choose a potential trigger. So for example, shoulder, upper body tension may or may not cause your migraine. You could choose a potential trigger from column B, stress, may or may not cause your migraine. You could choose one from column C, what and when you eat and drink may or may not cause your migraine. Um, you could choose a potential trigger from column D, um, not enough sleep or disrupted sleep, may or may not cause your headache or migraine. But when you combine column A and column B, column A, B, C, column C and D, that's when everything adds up to it. So what my job is as a practitioner and headache coach is to teach people and show them through actually their own um, diary keeping that I have them do in a really specific way so you can see cause and effect and then um, teach them how to recognize what their cause and effect is. What is it that adds up in your day? What's a pattern that adds up in your day that um, then produces the headache or migraine, say the next day or that night? Or what did you eat? Like say, okay, I ate, for example, peanut butter. And not necessarily a trigger, for, but for some people, peanuts are a trigger, but not for everybody. That's why um, headache lists, like lists of food and lists of this will cause your migraine. I want people to enjoy their lives. I don't want them to just cut out foods that they do enjoy. It's really, that's why we investigate so closely the cause and effect, because if it's not your trigger, then why eliminate it? Um, or if it's, uh, it might be your trigger when all the other 
um, areas of your life aren't in uh, alignment in that day. So say if you had some wine that night um, and you didn't eat a full day of protein and balanced meals and you were under stress and all these other things, you might get uh, a migraine the next day. But uh, if you did eat well, and then say you had a little celebration, Prosecco and chocolate cake, <laughs> Um, you might not get a migraine the next day. Then again, each of those trigger, potential triggers could be a factor for you, whether everything else is in alignment or not, whether everything else, uh, all your other practices are in place or not. So it's really close investigation of what it is for each person and having them start to be able to understand and see so that they can make the choice. It's like, well, I really want to have the celebration tonight and be able to enjoy myself. So um, if I eat well during the day, then I will, I can, I can make that choice, you know, or even if I did eat well during the day, these things have been a factor for me. And I know that I could get a migraine the next day, but I'm choosing to do it versus always being overwhelmed by pain, always being in pain and not knowing why it comes. Yeah, it's a whole other way of being. So um, the other thing is that, um, I can say I'm gonna run out of time if I don't stop talking <laughs> we go to these practices, but basically it's complex when you work with people who have pain, their stuff comes up, help them with their stuff. There's a, I, I really direct them into their body and listen to them carefully and work with their sensations. There's so many parts of it, but one of the missing pieces um, that was provided to me was um, by going to the first international, no, it was the fifth international somatics Congress in 1995 in San Francisco. And I attended a session by Dr. Clyde Ford, who presented here on the first day and is presenting again, if he hasn't already, on a panel. And he gave me one of the missing pieces to help people understand the mind-body connection um, in an exercise that he called Always Versus Never. And I use that in my book and um, because it really gives people the experience of the mind-body connection in real time. And also met Richard Strozzi Heckler at that conference and began training with him at the beginning of 1996. But that combined with the Hendricks work in wonder vision versus survival vision, because when people have been in pain for a really long time, they're afraid and they're, everything is contracted and closed up even though they're trying to find answers, they're trying to find it and those answers in uh, when they're under pressure because they're in pain and because they're afraid of the next pain. So um, the Hendricks talk about wonder vision versus survival vision. And um, Clyde Ford talked about letting your body move to match the feeling of when you're thinking that you're always gonna have something happen to you versus when you're never, you know, when it will never happen again. And those things make an immediate shift in your body. And so those processes, of, they're part of being basically in beginner's mind, which was a concept by Suzuki Roshi. Uh, in the expert's mind, there are a few possibilities, but in the beginner's mind, there are many. So that when people can look at something they've been dealing with for a long time, such as their pain, and um, you, they can open to new possibilities. They have to do it over and over again. So um, uh, that's why I start with this practice, the very first thing, because the whole time that you're solving your mystery and decoding it and changing your practices step by step, you're like a detective making those connections. And then if you think that you can't do it or your body really is more likely to go back to what it knows, go back to the fear, go back to the underlying history of say trauma that might have caused you to not be able to take care of yourself or to ignore your body or ignore your pain or numb it out then um it's it's a reminder that um oh are you in wonder vision or are you in survival vision so to keep pointing them back to being in wonder and curious about their pain and where it lives um, I want to say just a little bit about somatic shaping and trauma. So um, thinking, uh, a lot of people think that their pain is fixed. 
But my experience of pain, both in myself and working with people, is that it moves and it can um, move to different parts of your body, move to uh, just move and change and morph in all sorts of ways from stronger and less strong, both in the moment and over time when you're present to it. But thinking of it as a fixed thing can keep it stuck. And part of what keeps people stuck are their old patterns of reaction in their embodied shape. So trauma can play a big part of that. And a lot of times when people have, and that can be both physical trauma. So if somebody had a concussion and no longer they're cleared, they no longer have the concussion, but they still have um, some of the after effects of it. So say they're not sleeping well, or they have headaches still. And sometimes that can be from the concussion or from the physical trauma, but a lot of times what we find over time as we're working together is that some of those patterns were actually there way before they had their accident. So for example, um, in working with a client, um, those situations were true that he had, you know, was having trouble sleeping, that he was um, having headaches, migraines, but then in working with the face um, and easing out the face, he remembered that he had a previous history of biting his nails when he clenched his jaw. And then he was also remembering um, that he was yelled at a lot and as a child. And then he was actually pinched with his skin twisted um, as a child from one of his parents. And so he didn't think that was trauma because that wasn't real trauma to him, but that was a way that he learned how to shape and why he, how he learned how to shape to withstand that and to stay safe and to um, be able to survive. So even with injuries that cause other history and patterns and trauma can precede it and influence the healing process. So for him, it's really hard for him to stay present in his body. Even if we do a centering practice and we're at his feet, he jumps way up to his head and starts worrying again. So it's really step-by-step -step process of him really appreciating and feeling where he is making changes and just staying with that and like slowing down to not being afraid of the next thing. Um, let's see. So I'm gonna skip over some of, I, I wanna talk about how to work with pain and then work with pain um, a little bit. And I thought we could work on our face because the face, you know, we're working on screens and devices, we're working on computers so much. And so we're up close and personal. And uh, I thought of using our eyes so much and especially with headache and migraine people, um, even working on screens, uh, at screen, sitting, even watching TV can be a problem. Um, so, And, and also during the pandemic times when we're so isolated, um, especially if it, people live by themselves, they do also suffer from loss of touch. I can't tell you how many times it's come through my different social media feeds of just people saying, I wanna hug, <laughs> I wanna be hugged. Not to me personally, but they're just saying that they feel that loss and they really want that connection. So touch skills, especially self-touch, is um, really fabulous. And um, it also connects people to the notion that their pain relates to their tightness and holding because oftentimes people really don't get that. And so, and then also unwinding their history, especially um, the trauma to, to shift their capacity for self-care, which I just mentioned before. So how to work on your pain, work on it with curiosity and a spirit of exploration. Now, when you work on yourself, it's also really interesting because you're the practitioner and the client both. So you're working with interoception and in extraception because you're, you're feeling your pain from the inside and then you're coming along with your touch and you're working on yourself from the outside. So um, that's really the good news because you can, 
if you know how, you can give it to yourself exactly how you want it. <laughs> um, the disadvantage is that you have to work on yourself when you're in pain. So, um, you know, if you're having a horrible migraine, that's, you know, you really have to focus and it, it's a practice in itself to, to really, really be able to do that. Um, but it definitely can be done. So when you're working on yourself, you're basically dividing your attention um, between what you're feeling and then uh, on the inside, what you're touching on the outside, and then you're feeling the effects of that touch on the inside. And then you're feeling the, also the effects of that touch on the outside and acknowledging that. And so as you work on each point, people often feel that they are like, oh, my shoulder is sore. But when you really start working on it, it turns out to be a collection of painful points. So in that case, um, part of my technique is working point by point and releasing each point. And then lo and behold, your shoulder isn't sore. So a collection of the points. Um, I just also wanted to say that there's new research. I was invited to be on a, a panel at the NIH in last September, uh, there was a conference. It, it was like a conference, they called it a workshop by NIH Heal Initiative. And it was called the Myofascial Pain Workshop. And um, when I was researching my presentation for that, I came across some new research that really it made me feel very validated. And I was so excited to see it. It was had to do with operator, what they called in this one study by Ceratelli, I believe is how you say his name, um, called um, operator tactile awareness, which um, showed that when a practitioner works on a client or a patient, that um, where the practitioner's mind is, when they're working on that spot, so when they match their touch to their pain, to the client's pain, um, that the client felt a greater sense of relief. And then also there's some new research into fascia by Stecho, Franklin, Schleip, and Abraham, um, who I also studied in my presentation that works with not only your mind, matching your mind to your touch and working on fascia, but also your um, um, kind of like your mental litany or um, uh, what they called, I'm forgetting what they called, but how you uh, like a, an intentional dialogue that you use that matches up your touch and the pain and the sensations that you feel. So I found that really, really exciting because now the intention and using the mind to work with touch, not just work on bodies, not just as a physical being, but that somebody's mind from the outside can make a difference. Like that's huge, I thought. So, um, and you may have experienced this in your work and on your body. Uh, one more thing before we start working on our face is, um, so in working with people and not touching them, when I work with people, in my studio, which I'm not doing right now, um, I can teach them how to work on themselves, both by they'll feel relief when um, I'm working on them. And then this gives them uh, a, a key into, or an idea or a, a sensation really, how much pressure to use on themselves. Or I can refer to that when I'm um, teaching them how to work on themselves. But, in teaching people um, touch when, you're, when you haven't ever touched them, that's a whole other dimension. So um, it, in other words, how to teach pressure without touching. So, so I, like the three bears of touch, which I call, but I teach it in my book too, and I'm not touching them in the book. So the three bears of touch, if you work on yourself and or someone and you're not using enough pressure, then it's just, not going to get anywhere and just annoying. And those kind of strokes can be good for relaxing and smoothing out and smoothing lotion on, but they don't necessarily get deeply into the tissue to relax it, um, to release it. Um, if you work on somebody too hard, like then with too much pressure, then it can actually cause more pain. So it's a matter of finding that 
the medium. And that's going to depend on the body, the area of the body, minute by minute, how much tension and tightness or tenderness you might feel in that spot. And then um, if they have a migraine or not, they might feel super sensitive. So it really is variable. So it's a matter of meeting the pain without making more pain. Okay, now <laughs> um, let's, let's get to work. <laughs> and just let you know that we have about nine minutes. So if you give us some pet towel, that would be great. So just like right. the time is that. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna take my glasses off for this. And um, I have uh, two, I'm gonna give you the shorthand for it, but um, two main principles that I use working with touch. It's called um, puppy dog paws and little frog pads. So puppy dog paws, if you put your, the, your arms next to your body and you can't see me, but bend them up at the elbows so that you make puppy dog paws, like a little begging puppy. <laughs> Sometimes they even make the noise. So soft hands. So you can't, if you tighten your hands and put one hand in the, uh, on the back of the other and try and get in there with tight hands inside the webs between your bones, is this like uh, harsh? If you soften and put puppy dog paws on those, you can feel how you can ease your way into the tissue. So that's what we're looking for. And then little frog pads, you can see that I'm latched on. So this would be more like an effleurage stroke when you're getting massage or giving massage where you're rubbing over the surface of the skin, you're smoothing. So what we do instead is like little tree frogs who latch on to uh, in the rainforest, uh, the leaves with their little suction cup uh, feet. <laughs> this is what they're called, pads. Uh, they latch on so they don't slide off. So this is what we do. And then through that, you can feel with soft hands how you can get in. You can keep adjusting because all of a sudden you'll find your hands tight. And then also for this, we're going to work um, not on the tippy tips. Helps to have uh, short nails, cut your nails. Um, but we work on what I call the pads. So just basically through to the first knuckle so that you get... Um, a softer touch with it. So you just start at the top of your hair line or the top of your forehead. And latch on so that your fingers can be fairly close together because you can do a number of swaths and just leave your thumb free floating. And have your feet, it also always starts with your feet. Uh, so feet flat on the floor, hip distance apart, knees open. Direct line. You can, if you're in front of a desk, it helps to support your arms so they don't get tired. So I'm leaning at about a 45 degree angle onto the my desk. And just latch on. And just um, when you're working on the face, it's not that you go in so much layer by layer. It's really about getting some movement to happen over the bony structure and releasing the fascia. So Press and there's just do a slight downward traction toward your brow, but leave your fingers in place. And then slightly release your grip, uh, your pressure, and start to move down. And you can do this slowly. And then as you're doing it, listen for, it's like you're wringing out, when you wring out a towel or a washcloth, you leave a little bit of traction in so you can get it all the way out. So it's not like a wringing, but that concept of um, not lifting and placing, but uh, you could say stretching, but we're not listening to stretch, we're listening to more ease. So you're listening with your touch, you're feeling on the inside, touching, and seeing if you can feel slightly released till you get to the valley above your brow. And I'm going a little quickly. You can go, go at whatever pace it takes to just feel that easing happen. And when you get to the brow, I treat that like a ledge. So to the top, do slightly downward traction just above your brow in that valley. <sighs> and breathing. And then re, here's where you can place, replace your hands. And you can look here if you want. So I'm on the brow bone. My pinky is right. Um, on either side of my bridge of my nose. Uh, my ring finger is in, you might feel a little indentation. You don't want to press really hard, just a soft touch. Because 
then you make more pain. Uh, nerves and blood vessels come out of these openings. And then uh, my middle finger is about at the arch of the brow. And then my first finger, basically just on the side of the eye socket, the outside. And then um, you can also replace it. So we're not working on the soft part of the eye under the bone, so it's like a ledge. So under the brow and you can slightly use upward. Sorry, right, Jane, just interrupt you a little bit. We have about four minutes. So let you know the time. So what I think I'll do, if okay with you, I'm going to take questions because I haven't been looking at the chat, I'm sorry. Um, uh, in the discussion so that we can keep doing this, okay? And then um, I have another technique, you can release that. Oh, I wanna make sure that you, when you work on yourself, um, even though this work was very subtle and short, when you work on yourself, it's important to get rid of what you've collected. So um, shake it out. So I have this move that I do, hopefully you can see it, stand up where you bend your arm up and then shake it out. So if you can see my fingers like this, but shake it toward the floor. I'm holding my arm up a little bit, which you don't wanna do, but shake it out so your arm is no longer tired. It's like a spiral motion and like out, out, out. So your arms, not, and you can do it subtly too, but just getting that whole motion through the arm and getting rid of what you collect. And you can do that with both arms, both hands. Uh, really important to do. All right, let's. Yeah. So far, we have two minutes. Question. If yes, we have two minutes. So, if anyone has a question, you can maybe you can unmute yourself and ask Jane directly, and so we can be on time, or we can leave it into the discussion board as well. Yes, I'd so, like to do that in the discussion board and just continue with this one more minute. So. Yes. You you use your fingers like a tool, your three fingers, put them together, but still soft. And then you can use that same pull down move, press and pull on the bone right here, diagonally in the forehead, so continuing. And also the move that we did on the forehead, you can do another swath of it, um, a little more uh, laterally. So, but just pulling here, press and hold, press and hold. And I'm going quickly. <laughs> But you want to feel the ease, and then you can go under the eye on the top of the cheekbone. Go the sides of the nose, pressing in on the diagonal. Just on that space between the nose. The bottom, of the, the base of the cheekbone, and then under, and then the jaw. So press and release. And there are many other strokes. And then just can do continue for now that. Press and release with your thumb underneath, pushing up on the bone, and then to the chin, which is surprisingly often held on people. So using the crook side of your finger and then your thumb underneath on the bone, not the glands, just pulling down and pressing on the bone. I'll give you a nice little relief. I'm out of time. Thank you for being here with me. I really appreciate it. And I hope to see you in the discussion. I have my info up. I'll, I can put more info, but also my bio is up on the Meta website. I have a lot of info on there of how to reach me uh, at the Headache Coach. And um, thank you so much. Thank you, Jane, thank and you. thank you all for being here. And we invite you to visit the discussion board associated with this session to continue the conversation or your question to you give it to Jane. And you will also find the discussion board uh, back in with the session description. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.